we are pleased to introduce and welcome Stephen Adler from the Partnership on Artificial Intelligence. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank Dean Smith, Provost Poon, Dr. Fees, and of course, all the attendees and the other organizers who helped make this event happen. I also want to extend my appreciation to Brian Green of the Markula Center for Applied Ethics up at Santa Clara for helping to make this connection. Uh, they are one of our partners at the Partnership on AI. So who am I was the Partnership on AI? Uh, my role there is Chief of Staff uh, at an organization that brings together companies, academic research centers, advocacy nonprofits, and other people interested about the future consequences of AI and broadly help them to understand what is good ahead, what is bad ahead, and how do we ideally steer toward the good. Today I'm going to talk to you a bit about our organization's founding and some of the goals we have at the outset, some observations about the global AI conversation today, and then continue with a bit about our programming before turning it over to a Q&A session. So how were we founded? Uh, the partnership actually has a really interesting origin story dating back to the end of 2016, but it actually extends several years prior to that. So our founding partners are six of the largest for-profit technology companies in the world. They're Amazon, Apple, Google DeepMind, IBM, Microsoft, uh, and I should have said them in the normal order I do because I blanked on it. No, uh, Facebook. And the leaders of those organizations in AI research, or broadly research, often ran into each other on the research circuit and realized they had many of the same questions ahead about how is AI going to be used in society? How do we ensure that it's equitable? How do we ensure that its impacts are broadly distributed and that overall they're good for the world? Um, and out of that conversation came the realization that their organizations really can't go about it alone. They, there are some questions that one organization really doesn't have the political capital to take on, or they might not have a broad enough perspective. And for that reason, they really need to pull on the broader community. Um, what they realized soon thereafter is that actually technology companies themselves don't have all the answers. And that if it's just technology companies in a room trying to sort out these questions, they're going to be missing certain important perspectives. They're going to be approaching it from too narrow an angle. Or even if they do get to a good answer, society ultimately might not take it that seriously. There needs to be broader buy-in from all people who are going to be affected by AI if we hope to achieve this positive vision. So that was an important juncture in our organization's life at the beginning of 2017 in saying that we don't want to only be a trade association of technology companies interested in these issues, but actually we need to include the academics, we need to include groups like the ACLU and the MacArthur Foundation and have a broader approach to these problems. Uh, most recently, we're taking an even greater international focus. Uh, again, with the realization that though the US and Western Europe tend to be leaders in developing these technologies, ultimately AI is something that affects people around the world. And similar to only having technology companies in the room, uh, if you exclude large parts of the global conversation, particularly those who are going to be affected by AI, you are going to have an incomplete picture of the society that we want to strive for. So our mission broadly falls into four categories. The first and the top level is focusing on norms for what ethical AI usage should look like in the future. And that applies to companies, it applies to academic researchers and governments. Getting people together and identifying common challenges and saying, well, if we're all going about these issues differently, where are their best norms that we can land upon? We also want to be a convener of different organizations to be able to bring folks into the room together to talk about these issues who otherwise might not have channels or might perceive each other as adversaries. So within our community, we have many for-profit technology companies and also many nonprofits who are some of their, their most robust critics and have real concerns about ways that technology might be deployed going forward. And one of our roles is to facilitate the conversation there. We have two additional goals that kind of pile on on top of those. One around public engagement, be it both the media and government stakeholders, and helping them to nuance the conversation that happens around AI and really make sure that it's happening from an informed place. And finally, when we do identify great efforts for artificial intelligence, helping to, to catalyze resources around them, be it from our partners or going to the external community and say, well, what would it actually take to get this accomplished? And given the reach of our network and the buy-in that we have from these organizations, how do we make sure that we get it accomplished? So we have a few observations about the global AI conversation that I want to share with you all today. Um, but I think one, one point similar to the introduction that I want to make sure is clear 
is that we feel that too often in technology governance, the conversation happens at the level of those who are building the technology or the companies who are deploying it, but not as often the folks who will actually be affected by it. And that's a really, really broad community. There are only so many people who work at a large Facebook type institution versus a general purpose technology like artificial intelligence, which will eventually extend into all reaches of society. So that's an angle that we think is really important to help to facilitate. Uh, in terms of understanding future consequences of AI, particularly negative ones, we've actually observed quite an uptick in, in fears recently, um, some stemming from a book called Superintelligence, published by this academic Nick Bostrom roughly four or five years ago, and then picked up by several other prominent public figures in the time since. So you might have seen that the, st that the late Stephen Hawking would express fears about artificial intelligence, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, it's just a topic that's increasingly on the public consciousness. Uh, and we think that some focus on negative consequences is of use, but it is more important to segment it into the different types of ways it might play out. So to that extent, I thought maybe it would be helpful to go through examples in a particular application of artificial intelligence and talk about some of the challenges ahead and how we might be able to take action against them. So one line of programming that we at the partnership are really proud of and are standing up now is focused broadly on how artificial intelligence might affect media disinformation, misinformation, propaganda, whatever label that you want to apply to it. And I'll give an example in terms of AI tools being used by bad actors, AI tools with unintended consequences, and ultimately the type of society that we might form if we allow AI development to go unchecked without thoughtful input about how it ethically ought to proceed and making sure that the right voices are heard. Um, so quick, quick show of hands, who here is familiar with the idea of deep fakes? Okay, so a handful of people, um, I'll give a short, short introduction. So deep fakes are a tool that's become possible in the last handful of years here, in which you create synthetic media, especially video, and create really, really compelling fake footage of someone appearing to, to say something. So there's an example later in this presentation about a Belgian political party that actually created a fake video of President Trump um, arguing for the US to, to break a certain environmental accord. And the challenge with this is that as AI technology becomes increasingly capable and the amount of public footage that is available of people goes up, this becomes not only a risk for prominent folks like presidents or members of parliament, but increasingly all sorts of individual people. Um, so one, one fear is if you do not have a realistic way of telling what is authentic media versus what is AI manipulated and you don't really think about different ways to head that off, could individuals be susceptible to blackmail because there appears to be compelling video of them doing something that they didn't? Um, could you potentially frame people for crimes because we rely quite heavily upon firsthand vision or seeing a video of someone committing a crime seems to be really, really compelling. The underlying technology stack might no longer be all that compelling. Uh, a second example that I'll talk about in terms of unintended consequences, also in the line of propaganda or how AI might affect media, is that though AI uh, has the ability to optimize, it has the ability to detect features of things, say you want to create really compelling video footage that will engage with children online, um, for example, on YouTube Kids or an entertainment channel like that. There's, there's something really compelling about being able to cheaply deploy a technology, create many, many videos, very low cost, and basically pump out content. Um, the problem is, if the AI is focusing around things that humans maybe find somewhat disturbing or it goes unchecked and there isn't really human oversight into that process, what, what can happen in terms of those types of videos? So will you end up with very odd slogans? Will you end up with children being socialized in odd ways that we aren't quite used to or quite expecting? And then the third, the third vision that I'll talk about is in terms of AI tools and unwise trade-offs. And really, these are the ones that are somewhat hard to anticipate, because if we knew at the outset what are the unwise trade-offs that we are trending toward, we could just try to take corrective action and not go toward them. Um, and to that extent, we think that having the widest coverage possible of people in the room to be able to issue spot and say, well, have we considered this angle of the narrative or this angle of the application is really vital for making sure that AI does not end up in places that we don't want it to. And here we have the, the example that I spoke to just previously 
around deep fakes. Um, so what you see today is that for people like President Trump or President Barack Obama, you have lots and lots of high definition video with transcripts available from speeches, and that gives you the ability to create really accurate looking clips um, with very high levels of training precision because there's so much data available about these folks. And the question is, as both the amount of data about normal people increases and also the tools themselves increase in capabilities, does this extend into more normal members of the population? Another observation that we have about the global AI conversation today is you see many different countries launching national AI strategies. So this image here is from a New York Times article about the rise of China's AI strategy. Some of you may have read this. Uh, and a real effort to ramp up the amount of research and development and investment both within the government and also by members of the private sector. And there, there's a fear we hear in the community that when countries are approaching these problems in different ways and framing it as somewhat an arms race type dynamic, and that isn't specifically China, this is many countries broadly, that there isn't going to be the types of cooperation or collaboration that we need to have around these issues. And that ultimately AI as a software technology is one that can easily hop across borders. It isn't enough to have siloed conversations or to think who is going to be the leader here. Instead, countries need to be coming together and identifying these types of consensus issues to make sure that the technology as applied around the world is broadly good. So one thing that we are doing at the Partnership on AI in service of that is building out an increasingly international community. Um, so one, one action that we've taken in the last two weeks, actually, is we admitted our first mainland China for-profit organization to the partnership. We admitted Baidu, which is a large search player, somewhat akin to a Google in China. And the, the idea here isn't that there aren't concerns across different geographies or different approaches to using AI. Indeed, I think there are real cultural differences in how the technologies are going to be used by different groups. Our thinking is that it's better for people to have a seat at the table and to have direct dialogue around how to engage these ethical issues rather than to try to go it alone, given how high stakes the conversation ahead is. Um, so we have Baidu admitted in early 2019, we'll be going further into East Asia, Latin America, Africa, other geographies that to date we do not have as robustly represented, but we recognize that to really have a global conversation, we do need to have their voices at the table. Uh, and the, the, the last point that I'll highlight here in terms of the global conversation is that we often hear a disjunction between long-term futures of AI. These are somewhat the, the Nick Bostrom type concerns about what happens if we get an AI on the level of humans or even smarter and does it quickly spiral to very disastrous consequences versus more short-term concerns around biased data sets and the implementations that are actually happening out in the industry today and how we balance those two. And our thinking is that that actually isn't all that constructive a framing, and indeed, there are many issues where both sides do have interest in the meantime. So to give an example there, one concern around long-term futures of artificial intelligence is around a problem called value alignment and how you make sure that the goals that the AI is targeting are actually consistent with those of the, the humans who have built and deployed it. Similarly, you can't really have robust technology out in the field today if you don't know is it actually going to achieve the goals that you are putting into it. Or if you have concerns around, uh, say you are screening resumes as companies do with artificial intelligence, you need to make sure that you're able to commu clearly communicate a certain goal and that the artificial intelligence program will adhere to it. And if you aren't sure of that, then you have challenges in the short term or farther down the line. So with that, I want to talk a bit more about our, our programming, both the lines of work that we have live today and also what is coming down, down the road. So the primary point of programming we have today is something called working groups uh, in collaboration with our partners that are centered around areas like AI labor and the economy. And we pull on our member organizations to contribute leading experts within their organization and to scope out what might be high impact research uh, that can't be done by one organization alone and then to go and execute upon it. Coming down the pike, we also have uh, further programming that will be not as broadly collaborative, every partner in the same room, but instead companies who have a, a one-off challenge or something that they're grappling with internally will be able to pull on the partnership or others from our network and to have a rapid response type function 
to be able to explain to them or pull in the right voices and say, well, here are the different factors you should be thinking about. Here are the trade-offs that you need to plan for in launching a new AI product or in going into a new geography maybe that you aren't as familiar with. So the first three working groups that we have live today are focused on AI labor in the economy, broadly what is going to be the future disruption of AI to the workforce, and how do we make sure that there's still equitable impacts and that whatever way that AI unfolds, people have a mission and purpose and have ways of work should they want them. Safety critical AI, which is focused on topics like that value alignment. How do we make sure that AI is robust, particularly in areas like healthcare and automotive, where we see companies increasingly taking up that mantle and fair, transparent, and accountable AI. Broadly, algorithmic bias and making sure that we are able to root out bias that might exist, be it in the ways the data sets are collected, in the applications to which they're used, like lending or criminal justice, and making sure that we are thoughtful about those different domains. At the helm, we're very proud of the organizations who we have represented, both in terms of the perspectives they reflect and also some of the geographies. So within AI labor and the economy, we realize that this conversation often happens in, in the Western world uh, around white collar knowledge work. And uh, my personal observation is that as those forms of jobs have become more and more threatened by AI, the level of conversation and concern around them has also picked up as well. So within AI labor and the economy, we have a representative from the Center for Internet and Society India, as well as a representative from McKinsey Global Institute, who is one of the leading think tank voices around the future impacts of artificial intelligence. Within safety critical AI, we have a voice represented from Microsoft, Ashish Kapoor, as well as Peter Eckersley from the Electronic Frontier Foundation, one of the leaders in cybersecurity, privacy, and making sure that we balance um, consumer interests alongside these technologies that we deploy. And finally, in fair, transparent, and accountable AI, we have a representative from DeepMind, the artificial intelligence lab um, acquired by Google, now part of Alphabet as well as Ed Felton, who previously was in the Obama administration and now heads up the Center for Information Technology Policy at Princeton. Going forward, uh, we are launching additional working groups focused on important topics in AI, propaganda being one of them, and also thinking more about how humans and artificial intelligence might collaborate together toward good goals. We're also going to be standing up this rapid response function that I mentioned to both balance the need to have many voices in the room, the diverse community, as well as to operate a bit more agilely and to make sure that when a topic really arises in the press, we're able to get on top of it and make sure that we're getting people the right forms of information and questions to be asking. And with that, thank you all for listening and I will open it up to any questions. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I have a question with regards to uh, the, the project name that was sponsored by the Department of Defense and, and uh, Google being kind of uh, led by its 3,000 employees writing a letter to pull out from it. So in the context specifically of government, but in the military sector of the government, how do you balance ethics around AI when you have kind of ostensibly Project Maven doing research to, to understand computer vision for certain types of surveillance, and then there's ethics around what that ha has implications for. So I'm just curious about your thoughts around those topics. Sure, yeah, thank you for the question. So for anyone who wasn't able to hear it, it was broadly about Project Maven, uh, a, a Google program looking into using AI for a Department of Defense and what the appropriate role of technology co companies in military use cases is. So I think the question highlights a really good challenge ahead for AI and that AI technologies are ultimately dual use and that many of the same technologies that can be deployed toward good ends could also be deployed toward, toward bad ends. So the same type of computer vision system that might be able to be used to identify um, civilians in a battlefield or just general object recognition in a battlefield um, that could be deployed toward, well, we want to avoid targeting any area that is going to have those folks in versus could you use it to actually seek out combatants and then use that to target with increased precision. So one of the ways that we approach a question like that is trying to make sure that parties are actually really granular and specific with what their objections are to certain forms of practice. So we don't, as an organization, have a specific view on, on Project Maven, so I will not 
offer that proactively. But what we do think is important in the conversations is making sure that it isn't a wholesale, should AI be used by government or by military, um, but rather where, where is the specific principal objection. So to take uh, a, a maybe extreme example, right, but branches of the military that use email systems for internal communication that also might rely upon AI tools for spam filtering or for routing to the direct people or auto responses or things along those lines, it seems pretty clear to me are not the types of objections that people are raising when they talk about an issue like Project Maven. But understanding why that form of AI enablement versus others differ from each other, I think is important for unlocking what is ultimately the right answer. So let's just take that particular question, which is a great question. Do the employees, the ones who are actually crafting, do they have a right to be able to protest to say, these projects I will not work on? And does your organization allow them to have a voice as sometimes management is trying to reduce their voice and their activism? Sure. Uh, let, let me clarify. Are you asking within the context of the work that we do at the partnership or within no. the... In, in general, because I always get worried about workers. If we go back historically, we often had Catholic workers who did not want to work on projects dealing with creating nuclear weapons, as an example. So just as an example. So here we've had people at Amazon other places, a lot of workers saying, this is not okay. So it's coming from the people doing the technology to the management questioning what they're doing. So I wonder if your organization is going to help give them voice and allow that to happen or stay neutral. Sure. So I, I hear two sorts of questions in there, right? There's one question about more civil liberties and freedom of expression and how do you make sure that in the technology ecosystem people feel empowered to call out concerns that they have and ideally not, not face extreme consequences for helping to spot those issues. And then there's a separate question of um, how the partnership on AI engages with that work. So to the first question, I think it is really, really thorny and I would not purport to be a civil liberties expert. Um, my personal thinking on it and having spoken with people like DJ Patel, the former uh, US chief data scientist who has a really great talk in the works about how to balance some of these concerns is that companies ought to have people like an ombudsperson or someone who is accountable for the ethics of the systems internally who employees can kind of go to anonymously and individually to help surface some of those issues without needing to face, am I going to go to my direct line manager and come out vehemently against this, this issue individually and risk losing my job? Uh, and that's one such mechanism to help to rally people and to form more, more powerful blocks who ultimately can steer in that direction. In terms of the partnership on AI and what, what their role might be, uh, we don't have anything planned at the moment. I think that something like a neutral ombudsperson for the technology industry is something that is foreseeable in the future, although not, not planned at this moment. But what we do want to be able to do is when people have those concerns, the companies themselves can reach out to the partnership and say, who else should we be talking to? What is at the frontier of research in these fields? And what, what sorts of interests should we be considering in terms of these concerns that people have? How much merit is there to them? And what ought we do about them? Thanks. Hi, kind of just piggybacking off of the last question is how do you plan to hedge against the potential for stifling innovation, but as well as you may run into a problem that may be ethical, legal, or moral, and you might want to stifle that. So how do you, how does your partnership plan on essentially allowing people to innovate new forms of technology despite the fact that they have these problems and also protect various stakeholders from these negative externalities from the problems? Yeah, it's, it's a great question as well. I think that the way we hear our partners grappling with it is basic technology happens sometimes irrespective of the applications or the consequences. And it's sometimes in research generally, not just within artificial intelligence, 
but scientists might want to work on a problem because it's challenging or because it seems novel um, without considering what some of the knock-on effects might be. So the way that we approach that as an organization is helping to make sure that there is an eye to those effects. Um, so similar to the, there's been a movement more broadly in computer science um, by, the, by ACM that when people put out research articles, they ought not just think of their research in terms of blue sky, but they should actually think proactively about what could be negative impacts that arise from this research and make sure that if there are then steps that ought to happen, or maybe you come to the realization that you ought not open source a piece of research because we aren't really ready to guard against some of the consequences that might arise from it. Um, so that whole movement has taken off. And similarly, we're thinking about what analogs within artificial intelligence might be. Um, so OpenAI, which is one of our research partners as well, is generally open source in terms of putting out research findings and looking into innovation, but is not 100% committed to it, and in fact, might sometimes conduct research that they determine it actually isn't appropriate to put this out into society. And similarly, we are thinking along the same lines. Any other questions? Hi, you had mentioned that you know, most of the development of AI is happening in America and Europe, um, but ultimately it has an impact on a global level. Are there any negatives that you guys are, are seeing or expecting to happen, especially in developing uh, areas of the, of the world? Sure. Uh, in terms of expecting, I, I think ideally we would see them as concerns and figure out how to do something about them and hopefully head it off. I think one that I find personally concerning is how AI might impact inequality around the world. Um, so in the past when we've had automation and displacement of jobs, there's always been this idea that, well, you outsource to other countries where there's cheaper labor. Uh, and my concern is that some level of scale, there just might not be cheaper labor. And that countries who are not really um, full participants in the global economy today, or to the extent that they might hope to be, it might not be that they catch up over time. They might just be permanently left behind if there isn't a real um, dispersion of benefits from AI or ways for them to engage in the ecosystem and raise some of those concerns to governments, to others who are deploying the technology and ultimately will have knock-on impacts on them. Thanks. Kind of following up on that last question um, and also thinking more broadly about some of the negative effects of the bad actors that you're talking about. You talked about the need for national, uh, international collaboration on this, uh, because if there's problems with AI, is if there's one bad actor with the technology, that's enough to get all the bad consequences. And in the context of the dispersion of benefits, I guess the broader question is, do you think both of those problems are solvable at all within the context of a capitalist and nationally divided world? <laughs> it's a big question, right? Yeah, it's, it's striking how often in our internal conversations we do run up against barriers of organizations needing to balance doing maybe what they perceive as the right thing with doing the, the expedient or profit maximizing thing. So that is a pretty big concern that I have holistically. Um, one way that we thought about it is whether there are certain technologies like AI that might require a refactoring of what we think about as fiduciary duty of companies or their broader obligation to society in terms of if the future proceeds of AI might be so sufficiently high that they are unfathomable in the present, is there something that goes beyond traditional corporate social responsibility to say, if we do stumble upon this unfathomable amount of wealth, what obligations do we have to other stakeholders? Um, and going beyond shareholder maximization, which we tend to have in the United States, to something more like stakeholder capitalism, um, even that might not be far enough, but it is something on our mind. We certainly see it interlinked with the nature of, of capitalism and trying to push technologies for profit, not just technologies for good. Any other questions? Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.